interpreted thusly okay, and whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at least there'll be some sort of, and then you can go from there. Uh, what do you think? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just suggesting. Okay, T, uh, you know, at the end, about thought. Uh, you mean where we went? From? Yeah. Enough to do a lot. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, you, there was, I, I even could use the word revolution. Mm. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's wonderful. All right, we were everything okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Ten seconds. Okay. We'll just wait for all the other conversations. To <laughs> yeah. So I guess the best way to begin is to say that I know we're old friends, and old friends don't usually sit with one of them having notes on his lap to have a conversation, but this is a special occasion. I want to thank you for sitting down here this way. And so I hope you'll forgive the impropriety if I <laughs> read from some of these oh, notes. all right. I uh, have prepared some questions. Yes. Um, the first question is, uh, some people might find it unusual for a theoretical th physicist to have an interest in things like consciousness and the thinking process. But in fact, your work reflects a growing involvement with these and associated subjects over a period of many years. When did this interest begin? How and why has it become such an important aspect of your present work? And can what you now explore still be considered physics, theoretical or otherwise? Yes, well, I think my, implicitly my interest in consciousness began very early, but uh, the best, the, the earliest uh, incident that I can recall happened about at the age of 11 or 12, I can't remember, but uh, I was with some boys and we were in the mountains near Wilkes-Barre crossing a rather rapidly flowing stream. And that's in we, Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. In the States. Huh? That's right. And uh, there were a lot of rocks we had to cross on. They were rather far apart and very small. And you couldn't just step across them, and I felt very apprehensive. It was seemed a new situation. But I suddenly realized you had to jump from one to the other without stopping in between, that you were in a state of movement, mm -hmm. pivoting on one rock while you moved to the next. Uh, whereas I'd usually thought of going from one step to another, <laughs> uh, uh, I was mapping out the steps. And generally you were that's the way you functioned up until yes. that point? Yes. Well, I think people generally did, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you think before you... Well, act. you try to map it out a bit, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's more secure and so on. Uh, but, see, here was a case that wouldn't work, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you had to do it from moment to moment. Uh, well, that, uh, then after that, I felt that it, uh, no, it made a, you know, a deep impression on me that uh, this theme has recurred a lot in my work, you know, that uh, your consciousness is going moment by moment of awareness and not, uh, and not mapped out. Did, do you recall that coming back again later, b before you even went into physics? That, that well, I can't remember. You know, I don't really recall a lot of my childhood. I see. But I think this was combined with some tendency to feel, want to go beyond limits. You see, uh, when I was in this small town, city of Wilkes-Barre, you see, the, the nearest towns around it were called Ashley, Sugar Notch, and, and Warrior Run. <laughs> hmm. So that's all I knew. I mean, I didn't know them, but I knew about them. So and we went for a ride beyond Warrior Run. It seemed like going beyond of the world, you see. <laughs> I see. And the, the, so I had this notion of, uh, see, people talked about the world, and I said, where does it end? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and what answer did they give you? Well, I never, I, I don't remember. It wasn't terribly convincing, I suppose. <laughs> and so uh, I think that that notion used to fascinate me. I remember in third grade, perhaps, uh, there was a sort of a Nordic uh, folk tale of about some, some place which was east of the sun and west of the moon. Mm -hmm. The idea being that it was beyond all limits. Mm. And that idea always fascinated me. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that that, w that was combined. You see that uh, the uh, my I didn't really want to stay within limits. You see, mm -hmm. 
and this was combined with my interest in consciousness, I mean, which was mostly implicit at that time. I mean, I sure. didn't uh, very often think about it explicitly. Mm -hmm. Uh, what period of time was that in the, in what? chronologically? It was about the 20s or the 30s? It was in the 20s, yeah. The 20s. So the Depression hadn't yet... No, it hadn't come yet. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the Depression years? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, yes, they, uh, I recall them, you know, that there was a great deal of unemployment and suffering and uh, people were out of jobs and banks were failing. And, and you were in a coal mining area. In a coal mining area there. and. and uh, uh, people were talking about things getting very bad, you know, even revolution. Really? And, uh, and then Roosevelt came in and he produced all these new measures which gave people hope, you see. And I think they lifted things up a little bit and gave people some hope that at least it would get better. Uh, but I was very, I, I became very interested in politics because I thought, you know, we've got to do something about this sort of thing, you see, mm -hmm. as well as about the growing danger of war you know, with people like Mussolini and Hitler. Hmm. And still your interest in, in science was developing along, yes, along it was, with that? Yes, it was. And uh, uh, I, I became, you know, I, uh, I became interested. I used to go to the public library with a friend of mine. We'd get books on chemistry and physics and so mm -hmm. on. Studied them. I read the Scientific American about nuclear, atomic power. Mm -hmm. I read science fiction. The idea of atomic power fascinated me. I thought that that would be a solution. I mean, unlimited energy. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, your question was originally how I got into consciousness. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So uh, I think that. Uh, uh, I remember in college once uh, raising myself the question, are we totally determined or are we free, you see? And, and uh, is our consciousness free or is it determined like a machine? But at that time I concluded it didn't matter as long as <laughs> we were, at least could feel free to do what we wanted. <laughs> I see. Uh, so, uh, uh, but later I think, uh, uh, you see, when we came to study quantum mechanics when I was at Berkeley in California with Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. uh, there were friends there who knew, who were very interested in Niels Bohr. Now Niels Bohr had called attention to an analogy between thought and quantum mechanics, that in quantum mechanics whenever you observe something you change it in an unpredictable and uncontrollable way. You can't analyze it. Now if you try to look at your thought process it changes too. That is, if you try to define your thought it becomes unclear where it's going if it's to be, if it's going somewhere, then you, you know, sort of in momentum, then you don't define it. This was very similar to the behavior of the electron in quantum theory. Mm -hmm. So I felt there m might be some connection between consciousness and physics there. Later on, when you wrote your book on quantum theory, you actually did introduce. Yes, that. I, I brought that idea up. Yes, and that was in 1952. 1951. Yes. 51. Well, it was published in. And then in the book that followed it, uh, uh, the Causality and Change, uh, chance. and Chance in Modern Physics, uh, were there elements of that, uh, of consciousness? Uh, well, mentioned oh, mostly there? implicit. There's, uh, there I had the idea of this infinity of the universe, not merely quantitative, but qualitative, an infinity of levels of chance and necessity, to say that we look for laws that are necessary, like the Newton's laws, and then we discover there are limits to them. These limits are due to <coughs> necessity is what cannot be otherwise, and the limits are due to contingency is what can be otherwise, that the thing is bound to depend on something else. Right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, if you have a feather floating in the wind, if a feather floated in a vacuum, were in a vacuum, it would fall in the air, it's supported, and, it, and the slightest uh, breeze will shift it this way and that way, see, it, it can be otherwise. <laughs> in the vacuum it falls necessarily. Mm. So by connecting with a broader context you get contingency and if these are very complicated and chaotic you get chance, right, where you can't predict at all. Right. Now I know you, you connected those thoughts later on more specifically with respect to thought, but following the line of the development of consciousness, you went from writing that book yeah. to the theory of 
yeah. the special relativity book, if I remember. Yes. Yeah, you see, the point about the, the, the causality book was that it brought up this un, potentially unlimited uh, nature of reality, which yeah. would include consciousness, so it had something to do with that. Oh, yeah. The idea being that consciousness would have no uh, specifiable limits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Along with nature, I thought nature and consciousness were re not only reflecting each other, but actually uh, participating in each other. Now, was that considered a unique perception at that time? Well, I don't know how people considered it. Well, I was wondering if you got any sort of response from Well, that. I got some favorable reviews of the book, but I mean, they didn't really, that, that wasn't one of the main points stressed there. Now, in the, in the book that followed, I know there was an appendix to the special yes. relativity. Yes, right? and, uh, and uh, that was in the 60s, and uh, I, I wrote a book on special relativity with an appendix which I devoted to perception, and I said that there was an analogy between perception and uh, the way relativity treated things, that you, you couldn't, uh, according to relativity, everything was related to the way that you interacted with it to observe it, you see, mm -hmm. and also according to quantum mechanics. Right? Now, uh, see, the point about perception is that it's a dynamic process, that we are constantly doing things and then seeing what happens, right? handling objects and seeing what happens, or move. everything must move, the eyeball must move in order to show light, to show form. Mm -hmm. And we are, it's an active process. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, suppose we say we are uh, looking at a circular object, a solid, and as we walk around it, it really looks like an ellipse. You know, an artist draws it that way, with perspective. But we know by now that there are different uh, appearances of the circle. Mm -hmm. We say really it's a circle, which is solid, right? Yeah. So we could say the ellipse is their appearance, and the circle is the essence, right? But then scientists came along and said that's only an appearance too because the circle is made of a lot of atoms. It's really mostly empty space, atoms moving there. And, and therefore, the atoms are the essence. Huh? So, but then others, later on they came along and said these atoms are made of smaller objects. They're mostly empty space. Atoms too are appearances. <coughs> and then these smaller objects were found to be made of quarks and so on. There were electrons and protons then made of quarks. And then they said these are fields. And See, they're looking for a theory of everything, but it, it keeps on receding, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, so I say that this suggests to me that uh, uh, everything is, uh, even our thoughts are fundamentally appearances, how things appear to the mind, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we combine, by combining many views of the object, we understand the object, say, in the stereoscope, two views get three dimensions. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. So. I by combining many views of the circle, we, uh, of this object, we get the notion it's a circle. Mm -hmm. By combining it with the scientific view, we get another view on it, a circle which is made of atoms. But then mm -hmm. another view is that the atoms are constituted of smaller particles and so on. The more views we get that we can integrate and make cohere, the deeper our understanding of the, uh, uh, of the reality is, right? But I say the reality the, uh, the essence would be called the true being. That really, we never get hold of. Right? It, yeah. It's unlimited. Mm. Everything, every view is limited. It's like a mirror looking this way. Another, many, many mirrors. Each one gives a view, a limited view. Right? But see, so I said uh, theories don't give final true knowledge. They give a way of looking. The, the very word theoria in Greek means theater. Same word. It's sort of a theater of the mind that gives insight into the thing, right? And therefore, uh, yeah, so uh, you can say that fundamentally, science is involved in a perceptual enterprise, not, in, not primarily in gaining knowledge, though knowledge appears, but knowledge is a byproduct. Uh, mm -hmm. And by understanding the thing, you can coherently, then our contact with it, as long as it is coherent, it shows that our understanding is correct. You see, we must distinguish between correct appearances and incorrect appearances or illusory. Right? Now, if, if an appearance is correct, it is in some way related to the reality, but it's evidently not the reality. The ellipses, if we understand their meaning, are a correct appearance to the eye. Right? <laughs> Though it's not an ellipse, it's still correct. Hmm? 
So are you suggesting that this is an inherent aspect of the thinking process? Yes, so? that's right, and of our whole perceptual process. Mm -hmm. Our thinking process should be called an extension of our perception when done rightly. Of course, yeah. and not primarily the accumulation of knowledge, which we put into various records. Well, that's, that's a rather profound statement. Could, could you repeat that again? Our thinking process, uh, I would perhaps now make a distinction between thinking and thought. Thinking is an active verb, thinking. It means you're doing something. Mm -hmm. And one thing you're doing is criticizing your thoughts, or seeing whether they cohere. And if they don't, you begin to change them and experiment with others. You get, in, you get a, a new intuitions and new insights. And thought is the past participle. It's what has, what has been done. Yeah. It goes on the record, somewhat like a computer program, but that's not a very good analogy. I call it conditioning. You see, if we take Pavlov and his dogs, he had dogs who would salivate when they saw food. Now, he rang a bell associated with the food, and sooner or later they began to salivate just by the bell. So there's an elementary thought there, which was whenever a bell rings, see, the first, th uh, the first re reflex was whenever food is there, salivation occurs, right? That may have been built in mm -hmm. instinctively. The second reaction, which is conditioned, is whenever uh, the bell rings, salivation must occur. It didn't have to go through this step of saying this means the same as seeing the object, right? Mm. Now, I think that's a kind of elementary thought, you see, that every thought is active in that way. Mm. So if you say, whenever this happens, I need to do this. Whenever X happens, I need to do Y. Now, that, you don't have to think that immediately when X happens, you're already doing Y, right? It's a reflex. Now, that is the nature of thought. And one reflex leads to another, but you say, whenever I think this, I must uh, uh, conclude that. Whenever I s conclude that, I must go to the next step. You see, it may be established by association or by other ways, like reasoning. Hmm. We try to organize it logically. Or by similarities. Association in time is the simplest. Similarities and association by similarity. Or connection by logic. But once it's done, it's all the same. It's a reflex. See, logic is a reflex. <laughs> it becomes a learned... Uh, a learned yeah, uh, and it has to be criticized by watching for its coherence. A logical argument, uh, when it looked very logical, it's not always so. Hmm. It's often incoherent. You have to be sensitive to that. It's a perceptive process. Hmm. Hmm? And how much of that, of what we've just uh, uh, dis discussed, or I have listened to, was touched upon going back to the special yeah, relativity. Yeah, well, it was but rather implicit. Quite a bit of it was uh, touched upon. You had mentioned the Piaget work. The, pa pa the work of Piaget in which we say that the uh, child is always learning mm -hmm. and seeing he makes an action outward toward the object and handles it and he gets a perception. Now, if, his, if the action, if the perception does not cohere with the intention of the action, he has got to change the action. Is constantly learning, right? And you really mean cohere? You cohere. Mean well, I mean hold together in a coherent way, so mm -hmm. that if he expects a certain result and doesn't get it, it shows he didn't understand, right? Right. <laughs> so he's got to change his idea, his intention. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So learning is the constant uh, sensitivity to not getting the intended result and changing the intention until you get the intended result, right? I see. And that's a learning process. That's a learning. And I say that happens not only in perception of the young child that learns with the animal, but all the highest and most abstract logical thought is exactly the same. It's based on the same sequence. Yeah. And it is sequential almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. It? yeah. Yeah. And you see this learning as a, as a process, right? Hmm. And it, now it all depends. If, if we base it entirely on memory, on thought, and what has been done, then there's no reason it should work. You see? <laughs> It will go wrong. I mean, <laughs> whenever anything changes, huh? right. and things are always changing. Hmm. So you need uh, a, an awareness, a sensitivity to incoherence going beyond that. See, this is all with the nature of thought, you can see. This uh, aspect of coherence and incoherence is, yeah. is really at the core of it all. Yes. Without coherence, our, our actions are counterproductive and uh, lead to you know, at least they lead us to what we don't want. They can lead us to all sorts of tragedy and suffering. I, I'd like to hold that thought and, and come back to it because I know you, you speak in terms of a, uh, a coherent culture, uh, which is something which uh, appears to be uh, 
lacking at the present time, but I, I'd like to just complete the, the, the original question, which was following your line in, in your work, in your work in physics. Mm -hmm. After the relativity book uh, came, uh, the book of wholeness, wholeness and the, and the implicate order, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a further development. Now, I should say, to understand that, we should mention, go back to your first question uh, about why I'm interested in consciousness. Now, uh, 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 see, as a, um, I, I, I think, you see, I began to, to go into philosophy, you know, in the late 40s, mm -hmm. more interested in what is causality and so on. I, I became interested in more general questions. And uh, uh, this, the, some of these people in Berkeley had been interested in dialectical materialism. It seemed to have some valuable points, namely that they considered everything in its constant change and interrelationship rather than static, which was close to the view I wanted. It was also sort of an attempt to fuse uh, religion and, I mean, uh, science and... Uh, yeah, they tried to bring in science and so on. Now, uh, the, uh, I, I went to Brazil for a number of years where I met a man called Mario Schoenberg, who was also interested in Marxism, and he, he advised me to, he said we should read Hegel, who was really the source of a lot of Marx's ideas, and when I got to Israel, I read Hegel's logic, and there I found something very interesting that but we all know that he was saying, watch thought as a process. In other words, mm. it was really going along with my interests, you see. In other words, don't be that concerned with its content? Yes, right? yes. You see, uh, uh, even when I was crossing the stream, I was really thinking of the process, you see. Right? Mm. You know, not only the process of the body, but the process of implicitly the process of thought, which was trapping me in the old way, right? Mm. Mm. So the... Uh, it was because I thought in a certain way that I found the stream difficult. As soon as I, I had to have a sudden shift of thinking, and then I crossed the stream quite easily, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, now, uh, and, and that was thinking, right, not thought. That was an okay. act. That was very fast, you see, in, in one fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. it, was an, uh, it was a perception. And then an action. But it was a perception at the level of thought, and saying, you know, you have to move. There's a case, you can't map it all out. Here's a case where you have to be in movement mm -hmm. and from moment to moment. Right? Mm -hmm. I only put that in words later. Huh? Sure. So, uh, let's see, where were we now then? With Hegel. Yes, yeah. with Hegel. Well, he says thought is a process. You've got to, and he, one key thing he said, pay attention to thought, you see, as you would to anything else. Hmm. Now, I think people don't do that. They say thought just goes where it will. It seems to be something beyond uh, attention. Right? It just happens. <laughs> it's, uh, but, say, what can you pay attention to? You see, you have to pay attention to the order of the process. To the order of, of the, the process. process. Now, Hegel did that in the sense he paid attention to the order of development of concepts through what he called, you know, the, to posit the concept, you know, uh, the thesis and then the negation of it, the antithesis. Mm -hmm. And then he said, uh, these sort of uh, uh, nullify each other, and a new concept emerges, a synthesis, however, which d it contains the old ones as uh, sort of uh, uh, insubstantial forms, you see. And, uh, you was that a limited attempt at following? Because he, yeah. was, he was limiting himself. He was limiting himself to a very small part of thought, but still it was something The quite process was still perceived yeah. as yeah. process. Yeah, so he took thought as a process, which I think is a very radically uh, different way from most people, mm -hmm. most philosophers. And I don't know whether Marx did or not take thought as a process. He applied it to society, and implicitly he was doing it. But uh, the uh, those who followed Marx in communism probably missed the point altogether. Sure. <laughs> now the. Uh, uh, Anyway, the, the insight was very much clearer in Hegel, in spite of his rather difficult language. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> the uh, well, then uh, 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 we'll come back to the early '60s. You see, in the late '50s and early '60s, I was getting a bit uneasy about science, where it was going. You see the. Where was it going? Well, I felt physics, in particular, was moving in the direction of just simply wanting to calculate results, you see, and have equations and calculate results, and saying there was no way to understand anything at all. That, uh, that came out of what Bohr was saying, that mm -hmm. 
uh, were, like if, if you have an interference experiment, say you have two slits and a beam of electrons comes in, is detected at a screen. Now, there's what's called an interference pattern that you get a statistical pattern of detection of electrons. Now, if one slit is open, you get a certain pattern of two are open, you get another one. Mm -hmm. Now, the point is that in certain points, when two slits are open, the pattern has zero, has zero intensity. It's canceled at certain places and increased at others and produces what's called fringes. And if these were waves, you could understand it by saying the waves from one slit cancel the other at right. those places. But you always see electrons coming in as particles and they go out as particles, so <laughs> why should they be waves? And you would think they have to turn into a wave in between. Right? Mm -hmm. But what Bohr said was no, uh, that was beyond any possible ability of description or conception. It just happened, mm -hmm. and you could only calculate statistically what the results would be according to the quantum algorithm, as he called it. And that adhered as a, as a means of... Yes, now that, uh, most people didn't really understand Bohr's subtlety, but they, that view was developing anyway. And they said physics is primarily concerned with getting equations and calculating experimental results. Right? And didn't that sort of fit in with the, the, the psychological period, the time uh, when results were important? It yeah. was post-war and... Uh, well, it was probably the whole culture had been building up to it, but yeah. uh, the idea of understanding this thing, well, they didn't see the point. You see, they said, that. what more do you want? Mm -hmm. So there was no attempt to understand what was going on. It was just the results yeah. were what were They important. thought this was all you could do and what more could anybody want anyway. <laughs> okay. Right. We're getting results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, I was unhappy with that, and uh, I tried to talk another way in physics. Giving, I was developing a kind of a general cosmology, which I could understand, but most physicists didn't see the point. You see that I gave some talks, and they said, what, wonder what you're doing. You see, is this the kind of mathematics? Or, <laughs> you know, they, they couldn't see why I was doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Not that they were badly disposed toward me or anything, but they, they were just puzzled. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> uh, the... Uh, so I began to feel rather, wonder what, you know, there were many times when I felt that I wonder if I should go on with this, you see, with uh, physics. By that time, of course, you had worked with uh, uh, Einstein. Had, was, had he been supportive of Well, I, I, I didn't work with him. I had many discussions with him. We had correspondence. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he supported the idea of, uh, that we should look for some sort of reality, which we're talking about, and not just have this... I see. These calculations, right? I see. Yeah. So it was just you and him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in fact, there really was a dichotomy, though. There was most people just ignored that aspect of it. Yeah, or, or well, they thought that there were apparently proofs by a physicist called von Neumann that this would be impossible, and so on. Hmm. And you see, in 1951, I developed another interpretation where it was possible to look at it as a real. I said the electron was both a wave and a particle. Mm -hmm. So when it went through the slits, the wave went through both slits, the electron went through one, but the wave would influence the particle afterward, so uh -huh. it would uh, determine where it could arrive. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a typical example, but it, it would work out, but people didn't want to consider it because they said unless it gave no, uh, new results, <laughs> they wouldn't think of it, you see. So I didn't think of the argument then, but I see, the, the idea I proposed had, in fact, been proposed by de Broglie in 1927, and mm -hmm. I didn't know about it then. I knew later. And uh, he proposed it. It was discussed at the Solvay Congress in 1927, where all the leading physicists were, Einstein and Bohr and Pauli and others, and uh, they all jumped on it. See, Einstein didn't like it because he thought it was too simple and cheap. It didn't, uh, he didn't think it would fit relativity. And the others just simply didn't like it, and, uh, the, uh, because they had different ideas of their own, right? Mm -hmm. So they even made fun of it, and uh, they, I can't remember the terms, but... Uh, and then de Broglie got discouraged and gave it up, but, see, I wrote this paper, and after that de Broglie took it up again, but uh, in this paper I answered those objections that they mm -hmm. made and uh, developed the thing further, right? I see. Now, but in the whole, it, it, it fell on the rest of the physics community like a thud on lead, you see, <laughs> like mm -hmm. dropping a ball. On. It appears that it has been uh, uh, revitalized, that perception, well, in I, recent times. Well, I've been continuing recently to develop it, and now writing a book on it with my colleague Basil Hiley, and mm -hmm. uh, we're getting more interest from some of the philosophers of science, and I don't know, some, some physicists. Mm. 
uh, um, I, I think maybe it will increase. I see. So we digress to get to that point to go back to the 60s, and we're still following the line. We're on the, we were on the wholeness and the implicate order. Yeah, but I mean, this is part of it, of course, to say the... Leading up to it. Now, you see, then I went, uh, you see, at that point, I, uh, uh, you know, I got um, in touch with this man, Krishnamurti. There in the public library, there was a book, and in that book, uh, um, there was a phrase, you know, the observer and the observed, you see, and I thought this fellow would... Uh, 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 would, you know, was on the same line as I. Could we pause there for a moment now, because that's that's a, a giant leap for, for yeah. some of us. Uh, as I understand it, the observer and the observed had been introduced as a perception by Werner Heisenberg. Mm, well, uh, uh, Bohr first. Bohr about first, and then Heisenberg taken up by. Uh, well, both about the same time in different mm -hmm. ways, and. So it was and that, a, it and that was, was my interest, just their oneness of the observer and the observed, which was due, according to them, to the indivisible quantum link hmm. between observer and observed. Really? Okay. And this was partly responsible for the analogy between thought and quantum process, hmm. right, which I mentioned before. Right. You got it? Right. So you were in the library one afternoon. Well, and you're, actually, you're, it was you're, my you're, wife who was <laughs> in there, and she <laughs> found the book and saw the phrase. And uh -huh. She always objects to my bringing it up. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, and she, uh, but anyway, I read the book very avidly, and uh, I said, okay, I must uh, talk with this man. And he hadn't been, in, well, I wrote to the publisher, and apparently he'd been ill for a while, but he was coming to England and to talk. And what year was this? 1961. 61. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the uh, so uh, uh, I met him in London, and we had a very you know he he didn't know any physics, but still he listened to me talk about it. <laughs> it was a very great interest. And so it was a warm uh, yeah. attraction to each other from yeah. the very beginning. Yeah, we sort of had an instant communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the you may ask you know why was I interested in a man like Krishnamurti? You would think people might have thought of him as a mystic. Well. I was in, getting interested in all sorts of broader philosophy then. And, uh, I had the notion that I think part of my whole uh, cosmology was that the mind and uh, matter were interconnected, two yeah. sides of one uh, thing. And therefore, that we, we not only had connection to the world through the senses, but in some deeper level. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought maybe somebody like Krishnamurti, with all the perceptions that he had, which I could read about, but perhaps I've been in that, had that possibility. And those perceptions are manifested in everyday life, as a, I mean, he was trying to explain those. Well, but he, he sort of perceived, it seemed to me, he sort of perceived directly some sort of directly. wholeness, this wholeness of the mm -hmm. universe and the observer and the observed and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't know quite what it meant, but I, it sort of looked as if it would be important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, the, uh, see, I, uh, if you remember that I s always felt I would like to get beyond all limits. I mean, I didn't want to stay within the limits of physics as physicists had defined it. <laughs> really? I was already getting to the point where I said I couldn't stay there any longer. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, in fact, uh, you had even thought about leaving physics. Yes, yeah, so well, even in, uh, even in the early 50s, you know, late 40s, rather, when I, some, just after the war, that attitude became prevalent, and I was mm. thinking of it. But... Uh, so, uh, but I didn't actually leave physics, but anyway, uh, I, I did uh, follow this thing up with Krishnamurti, and we met every year when he came to London, and later I went to Switzerland where he gave talks, and later he established a school in near London, and uh, uh, I used to take part in that. Mm -hmm. Now, we had many discussions, you see. Now, uh, through, I think uh, partly through these discussions, I'll, well, not entirely. I came to this idea of the implicate order. At least it greatly encouraged me in that direction. I may have had the idea before in a very germ form, but could we could we pause there for a moment again? The term implicate, yeah, uh, it, it seems to be connected and, to the word imply or, uh, and enfold. Yes, the word implicate is the same root as imply. It means enfold, enfold in Latin, and explicate to unfold and explicit. Right? Explicit. Yeah, so if you say one thought implies another, it means that the thought is unfolded, right? Mm -hmm. unfolded. In other words, if I'm speaking of something, it may imply something else. Yeah, but that's already unfolded in your mind. Right. 
and it comes out, and ex mm -hmm. becomes explicit. Now, uh, the idea was that you can think, say, of a piece of paper which you fold up many times and you make little cuts in it. When you unfold it, the whole pattern appears. Right. right. Uh, many other ideas and examples would I could come to mind, but I haven't time really. Right, but essentially you're saying that would be the unfolded part would be when yeah, it's... Uh, when it's all together and then when it becomes... Folds. But then there's a reverse process of unfolding. Unfolding again. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw that you could understand the quantum mechanics in terms of that process that instead of saying an electron, for example, is a particle just moving along, you could think that there's a wave coming in, unfolding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really unfolding to a point. It's unfolded in the whole universe. Then it folds back. Then another wave comes in, in a slightly different point. You get, you get a series of points that are very close together, so we imagine they're a particle. Right? Mm -hmm. But because of that wave nature from which it comes, you can understand the wave-particle nature. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a wave. You understand that. And because we're used to seeing things in movement uh, on this macro level, yeah. the assumption has been that that's the way the electron... Yeah. Yes, we are, we've been extrapolating the macro. And then when you found the way the macro level works, and when you found in quantum mechanics it didn't make sense, you said there's nothing more to do except calculate. Right? Mm -hmm. could, could we, again, the, that was found, that was the, the quantum, the term quantum itself has its base in that? Well, the quantum, that's one of the features of quantum theory. Quantum has its base in the fact that energy is transferred in discrete jumps, or quanta, mm -hmm. and rather than continuously. I see. Now, you can see that some sort of quantum appears here that, that uh, the uh, wave comes to a point, then there's a jump to another point. Mm -hmm. See, one thing, according to quantum theory, was the electron could go from one state to another without passing in between. Now, you said that uh, utter mystery, right? Right. But you see, if the wave comes into this point, then it spreads out, it could come into another come point. Into another one. You see, so, uh, therefore, it needn't look so mysterious. Is it, is it possible to, to, to state that that's the way thought the thinking process? Uh, yes, that, uh, I would, that we could anticipate by saying that's how the thinking process goes. It, it goes in, it unfolds, it, it's unfolded in your consciousness, it unfolds to a certain thought, folds back, and the next thought appears different. A series of thoughts not too different seem to be continuous. Right? And is that where the now popular term quantum leap has its origins, actually? Well, the, those the, jumps, yes. Those jumps. Those yes, they take the idea of a jump that doesn't pass in between. Mm -hmm. So and there's that no jump, way of knowing how, uh, how it gets from point A to point B in a mac on a macro level. No, that jump is creative, you see. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, from this, from the explanation I gave. Surely. You see, to say it, the quantum jump or quantum leap is a creative process. Mm -hmm. And you're suggesting that in the implicate order that, that it manifests in another place as opposed to yeah, actually that's right. traveling from point A to yeah. point B. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the, the uh, basic line of reasoning in the wholeness and the implicate order of yeah. work. And, and which connected consciousness with matter mm -hmm. because they had a parallel process, right? In other words, at that basic implicate level, all... All existence, all being. All, all being was... Was in one order. I call mm -hmm. it the implicate order because it's the order of enfoldment that counts, not the order of movement on a line. Hmm. So that the, 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 the greater, the action itself really takes place in the implicate. Yes. And, and the... It manifests in the explicate. And it manifests in the ex explicate. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's part of the same tradition of science saying that what we thought was the essence is now the appearance. Say that again. That's the, Okay. What we thought was the essence, essence... is now seen to be another appearance, right? Namely, that the particle which was explaining everything is the essence of reality. What is appearance is also an appearance. Is also in addition to its being essence. No, it, it, everything is both essence oh, and of appearance course, in I that see, sense. But, but uh, it, it, see, all appearances are essential. <laughs> or else we wouldn't <laughs> yeah, be able to see them. They're all appearances, and uh, <laughs> the essence as the true being is unknown, right? Uh huh. Even the implicate order is merely a concept. Surely. So even that should turn out to be an appearance. But we say by bringing in deeper, m more penetrating appearances, we are understand better. That's all. Mm -hmm. We are never going to grasp the whole. Mm -hmm. And that has its own implications in uh, understanding the world as we perceive it. Yes. Yes. So, see, this is against the view which some 
a large number of physicists coming out saying we're going to get a theory of everything, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 19th century, ap after Newton had been so successful for several centuries, one of the leading physicists of the time, Lord Kelvin, said it's no use for, for young people to go into physics. It's nearly finished. It's only a matter of the next decimal point being refined. Mm -hmm. Try something else. <laughs> <laughs> so he said there are two small clouds on the horizon, the negative results of the Michelson-Morley experiment and the problems of black body radiation. Uh, these were the right clouds because each one of these led to a revolution, one to relativity, the other to quantum. They were the wrong ones for Kelvin, unfortunately. Well, they were, he chose his clouds very well, <laughs> very but carefully. he thought they were small clouds, you uh -huh. see. And in fact, the revolution came out of them. Now, we still have much bigger clouds on the horizon today. At the present time, as a result of... No, the no, but physics has developed onward into all sorts of new things. And mm -hmm. A lot of things are not understood today, more serious than that was then, but people still talk of the theory of everything. They, they live in hope, you see. I see. And, and this theory of everything, is it somehow tied into the tie into the unified theory that Einstein was... Uh, well, that would be a, to try a realization of Einstein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, there's no harm in having a, a unified theory, but just don't say it, it covers everything, because yeah. it will be also an appearance. And essentially the, you're saying that all theories are that. They yeah. are a, a way of looking at things as opposed yeah, that's to right, yes. an absolute uh, Yes, truth. it will be an appearance. See, we'll have a... a, a it will be an appearance which reflects, uh, in principle, everything. You see, the whole, right? Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of mirrors by which we can see um, different things. So this will be an appearance of a whole, mm -hmm. which may even include ourselves. You see, in other words, we see ourselves in this mirror, too. Okay. Can I make a quantum leap and suggest that because, if, if such is the case, then to take our thinking process as absolute yeah. is, is, a, a, a not pro is a mistake. Yes. <laughs> Yes, just from and, scientific... And the results of the thinking process as well. Yes, just from scientific point of view alone, it's a mistake. But it's a mistake if you look directly at the process, you could see how much how serious that mistake is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now at the present time, you find that your work on the unconsciousness is, in fact, parallel to the other work you're doing in, in uh, and in fact, possibly paramount. The, the, the yes. book that you're bringing out... In the, Mr. Hiley, uh, uh, well, that's on quantum theory. That's that's really a, an attempt to bring out some of the stuff we, you know, on the, we did say thirty. I did thirty years ago, or forty years ago. Mm -hmm. But it has to do with uh, a, a, an approach other than uh, Bohr's approach. Yes, that's right. Uh, could you explain the difference between the two approaches? Well, Bohr's approach is to say nothing can be said about it at all, but just to calculate, right? I see. Now this attempts to give a concept of it, right? Yes, a concept. Uh, another appearance, let's call it. Another appearance. <laughs> but, but it's heavily leaning toward meaning, as I understand. Yes. Well, it gives more meaning in the sense that if we have the implicate order and so on with the consciousness in a similar order, we have a creative order which has more meaning, you see. Uh, see, in this mechanical order, it would be very hard to get much meaning, mm -hmm. or in the order of just calculating things. Mm -hmm. And you see, as Steven Weinberg has said, one of the leading theoretical physicists of the time, that uh, the more they look the more into the cosmos, the less they see meaning, you see. And, uh, but that's inevitable if you say, anyway, you're just calculating. You see. I see. And do you think that perception is permeating our society? Well, it has an effect because ultimately society is highly affected by science as it once was by religion, which now has no longer the source of our uh, worldview. Mm -hmm. Science is the source of the worldview that religion used to give. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, the view of totality has great power mm -hmm. because the view of totality in principle has supreme value. You see that see, God, what would he be? He's made everything so he has the highest possible value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if the universe, which has the highest possible value, is meaningless, <laughs> then, then there's not what else can have value. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, in, in pursuing your, your uh, avenue of uh, inquiry, uh, it is essentially uh, attempting to bring meaning back into life. Well, it, it would say that there's no, no reason to do what they're doing. That's the first <laughs> point. Yes, yeah. and, uh, the universe isn't what they say it is, so there's room <laughs> so in it for all sorts of unlimited uh, meaning, you see. Mm -hmm. If you say the universe is even in matter, it is creative, then much more so in mind. I see. Are there aspects of consciousness in the new book that's coming out? Are, are, are they well, we have the uh, last chapter. We'll discuss consciousness. You will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that brings us up to date with respect to the the line that you followed yes. from the from the beginning. 
Uh, my next question is, in fact, connected with it. Uh, you've likened your own perception of how we comp comprehend reality to uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. Could we explore that element of it? Well, in Plato's allegory of the cave, the people were chained and looking at the shadows on the cave and trying to see regularity in the shadows. You could imagine them doing calculations, saying that there's a certain probability that this shadow <laughs> would become that shadow, and so on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, Plato suggested that that they were, if they were able to turn around and look at the light, well, first of all, they would be blinded, but eventually they would see that these shadows were only shadows. Right? Mm -hmm. well, I would say that the, in, in some sense, it's whatever we see is a kind of shadow, it's an appearance, but to, under, but to understand that they are shadows and that we can get more and more appearances is crucial. Right? And get lost in the shadows. Yeah, well, if we take the shadows to be the reality, you see, the essential point is to see the shadows are not the reality, but they still may uh, throw light. They, oh, you can't say a shadow throws light, but <laughs> you say they may still be relevant to reality. Relevant if you to understand reality. what they are. Mm -hmm. The shadow it gives could, you... Oh, if you understand it as a shadow as opposed to yeah, the, the, the ultimate reality. The shadow gives reality. you information about yeah, reality, right? Of course, yeah. Uh, and with respect to the light itself? Well, the light would be the unknown light. I see. If we take it to be a consciousness, the light is a kind of intelligence which is in the deeper even than the implicate order. It's enfolded and beyond, right? So the implicate order has other orders beyond it. Yes, it well, the higher order implicate orders, but eventually it sort of goes off to a horizon which we can't uh, grasp. Mm -hmm. We say that's the source of the light of intelligence, right? I see, and that would be what uh, other, uh, in the past has been known as the unknowable or the, the ineffable? Unknown. Yes, the ineffable and so on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so this would be a scientific, scientific pointing to the ineffable? Yes. Well, that's a revelation <laughs> in itself, I would think. Yes, and we'd say that that light is needed to be thrown on thought. Mm -hmm. If it isn't, thought will be taken, thought is a bunch of shadows which will be taken for realities. Mm. And you can really prettify those shadows so that they become totally mesmerizing. And yeah. And we are lost in that as the real reality. Yeah. Mm. Uh, following that the allegorical train, uh, I know that uh, uh, not long ago I once heard you describe a scenario for a science fiction movie that is essentially uh, an artistic metaphor for our present state of consciousness. If you remember the story? Yes. Yes, well, it was a story about very advanced beings from some distant galaxy journeying through space, and uh, they, their, their way of exploring was to send very highly developed robots to explore the planets, right? Mm -hmm. they, these, each robot had an onboard computer to deal with local problems, but ultimately there was a central computer that proved behind it all, right? right, for all the robots. And you see, these robots came to a certain planet, and they started exploring, and they went into a very deep cave and lost contact with the central computer. <laughs> and they began to think independently, <laughs> and uh, they got rather confused, and they began to think that they were independent robots, <laughs> independent beings. Right. And then they came out, they, they started, each one was independent, so they all started to fight each other. Mm -hmm. And they did all sorts of things to each other. And this, the beings at the, the center didn't know what to do. You see, the, the central computer, there was no way to force the robots to do anything. To, uh -huh. Only information could work, right? Right. So they, they were already rejecting the, the information from the central computer, saying it doesn't exist, you see, mm -hmm. because we're independent, right? <laughs> so therefore, uh, they... Uh, <laughs> so in fact, that information that was being transmitted was real information, yeah. which would imply that force or power could not be used, That's otherwise right. it would not be It would true make no sense, yeah. Right. Uh, so, so th then they would, so this uh, center, so therefore from the central ship came, they sent more robots to try to talk directly to the other robots, and these robots were either worshipped as God or else they were destroyed, yeah. <laughs> or both, right? Or both. <laughs> yes. And the, uh, as a matter of fact, the problem is still there. They have never, not, they have not yet solved that problem. I see. <laughs> In fact, we haven't. Which really brings me to my next question. Um, um, those robots in the cave uh, c c created a sense of them being independent of any other source, as it were. And uh, 
we might liken that that uh, state as the I, yeah, the self, yeah, the self. So the question is, does the I really exist, or is it an illusion? If it is an illusion, how is it that we appear to be able to create or think a thought? Is the I really separate from thought? Yes. Well, I, and to put it briefly, I'd say the I, the I as we know it is not separate from thought. That's a, that the I which feels itself to be separate is thought. Now, what, there may be, there was an ancient view of the self, uh, which was that I, I am the unknown. I'm an unknown which is constantly revealing itself, uh, mm -hmm. which is different from the ordinary concept of the self, uh, which is something known with identity. Mm. Mm. The self is something with identity over time and limited, right? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be, but also in unlimited because you have this megalomania, this wish to make the self, uh, it doesn't want to stay limited, right? Yes. Now, uh, how could the self be thought? You see, uh, uh, you have to see how thought works. You see, let's come back. First of all, if you see um, a television program with a telephone bell in there and the bell rings, your thought immediately attributes it to the image, and you feel, experience it coming from the image. There's nothing there in the image at all, right? Mm -hmm. But suppose nobody gets up to ring the bell, there's an inco to answer, answer the, the phone, there's an incoherence, mm -hmm. and you wonder, is it, where is it coming from? It may be coming from the next room, then you see it differently, right? Mm -hmm. So the uh, point is that thought can attribute to real things to put shape and form and figure into them and make them s seem what, what something else, right? Like if you take the rainbow, it's nothing but rain falling and light refracting off the raindrops, right? But you see a bow. There's a figure thrown onto the raindrops. Hmm? Is that clear? Yes. Everybody sees the same bow. That's proof. It should be your guys' proof. It must be there, right? Right. <laughs> but it's not there. But in fact, everyone sees a different one. Uh, every, he sees his own rainbow. Everyone see. sees his own but rainbow. But very similar. Yeah. That's what the, what the chair is seen the same way, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an appearance which is not an appearance of... That bow is not... A correct appearance of reality, right? Mm -hmm. And yet there's a tacit agreement that it is... Well, people now know that it's not there, you see, but... They don't I didn't know. <laughs> they used to say, chase the rainbow and find right. the pot of gold at the end. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, I, I don't know that it's common knowledge that what we're all looking at is different rainbows. Yeah. The, the but I mean, but at least they're not... They're all related to a chair, but in the case of the rainbow, they're not related... They're at only all. related to the drops of rain, you see, Absolutely. not to a bow. Now. Now, this is crucial because if you can throw onto the drops of rain a bow, you could throw on any shape onto the drops of rain, and mm -hmm. everybody might agree that that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, consciousness is full of all sorts of events going on, feelings, you know, little things going on here and there. Mm -hmm. And the thought throws onto it a shape called me. Hmm. You see, at a center, you may feel it to be in the solar plexus or the chest or the head. Can we stop again? You're saying thought projects that? Yes, that as it's projected the rainbow. If you, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So thought creates the me rather than me creating. Yes, but, but then when, if you don't see that happening, you will treat that as real and give it reality, apparent reality. Mm -hmm. You will take action. The, the whole being will take actions on that basis, which seem to be coming from the center. Hmm. As the uh, telephone sound seems to be coming from the telephone, from the television image, when it couldn't possibly be doing so. But it has to be gaining some, some kind of strength if it's capable of, in fact, thinking about a specific. Uh, well, the strength comes from your whole being. You see, there's thoughts. And remember the nature of uh, thought as conditioned reflex. Oh, right. One thought leads to another, <laughs> right. to another. You don't yeah. have to do anything. Yeah, it's, it's doing it for you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's doing it for you. And yes. For me. Uh, remember, thought is conditioned reflex mm -hmm. at a very high, subtle level. And mm -hmm. It just goes by itself, but it has in it the thought that that thought is being produced by a center which it calls me, and mm -hmm. all the feelings which should belong to that center are thrown onto the consciousness as if from me, right? And in fact, our society reinforces that. Everybody that. says the same, like everybody sees the same rainbow, everybody sees the same self, whether it's there or not, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, in fact, we can create concepts that everyone sees, like That's right. nationalism. And yes, and in fact, later on, it becomes all important. It's regarded as central, it's supremely important, and all sorts of powerful feelings will arise if it's questioned. Mm -hmm. You see, now it all goes on by itself, and you see what the, there's a deeper being, I say, which can um, 
which is that being which is kind of may be able to reveal itself in you rather than being a fixed being it's deep in the implicate order in the infinite and that being ha is not an I well we don't know what it is it's unknown as long as all this is going on how are you going to tell you of see? course of course I mean it's like all the lights in the city you can't see the universe surely I remember that that uh, when you, you mentioned about being in Las Vegas, yeah, uh, could you repeat that? that yes, analogy? well, that, 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 that just simply in Las Vegas, there's a vast number of flashing lights, and you could never see the stars. You might imagine that there is no universe other than Las Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. And similarly, you might imagine that the universe we experience through the self is the universe, mm -hmm. but in fact, maybe just thrown on like the rainbows. And in fact, within the socio-cultural patterns that we've established, yeah, uh, there is that. Razzle dazzle happening all the time. Yes, isn't noise, there? lights, whatnot. Mm -hmm. That's exci excitement. Hmm. Mm. Uh, there, let me just take this one step further. Uh, I'll go back to the book, The Causality and Chance in Modern Physics, because there you did men mention, to my knowledge, for the first time, necessity and contingency. Yes. How do necessity and contingency work together to perpetuate what? Yes, appears uh, to be self-deception. This is a crucial point that, you see, the word necessity, necessary, means it cannot be otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. And contingency is the opposite, what can be otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Latin root of necessary is necessi, meaning don't yield. Mm -hmm. it mean, so when you think something is necessary, you also get a feeling of an attitude, not yielding, right? Mm -hmm. It's what cannot be turned aside, you see. Now, it's very important in our thought to make order of priorities of necessity so that A turns aside for B, and B turns aside for C, and so on. Hmm? That happens mechanically? Well, well, either intelligently or mechanically. Some things are more important than others. You say, I say this is necessary, but that is more important, so I do that, right? Mm -hmm. But that can go wrong. Hmm? We, can, we can give extreme necessity to trivialities, right? Mm -hmm. Call right. the time. <laughs> yeah. So, now, the, the point to remember is necessity is not just an intellectual concept. It is a feeling. It is an urge, a drive. The will is determined by what you think is necessary. Mm -hmm. The more necessary you think it is, the stronger the will and the stronger the desire. Mm -hmm. So the whole movement is... for The idea that thought is only thought is wrong. You see, it all, all these conditioned reflexes go on together. Mm. Now, necessity may be perceived. I'm not saying it's only a reflex. Of course. It can be perceived afresh, mm -hmm. but it goes on to the uh, conditioning, mm -hmm. becomes a set of reflexes, right? Now, the reflex of necessity works without your thinking by the feeling of the urge, the will, the drive, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Intense will, huh? drive, need. And again, the, those necessities, are, the values applied to the necessities can be arbitrary. That's right, but they vary. Now, there's the, the, you see, that which is absolutely necessary would be supremely valuable and take priority over everything else. Mm. You see, if you think God is there, then you might give his will absolute necessity. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the state may take absolute necessity or, or something else, your personal ambition, the desire to expand your ego, to be megalomaniac. Mm -hmm. Anything make money. Anything could take absolute necessity, or even the most trivial pursuit. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What 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 makes it absolute in our mind? What what well, causes just, that absoluteness? Well, you aspect? see, we say something is necessary. Now we start to make a conditioned reflex, saying that we did it this time, this time, this time. There's a tendency mm -hmm. now to make it saying it's always so. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's always so, then it's a small step to say it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And if you say it's always necessary, then it's absolute. Right? Right. You see, step by step, we slide into absolute necessity. Right? Which is at the core of yeah. self-deception. That's right, because if there's absolute necessity, it is absolutely necessary to keep on thinking that this idea is absolutely necessary, <laughs> and it cannot be questioned. right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have to, have to distort and deceive yourself. And is that, does that seem to be prevalent at the present time? Well, all times that we know of, it's been prevalent. And it's people, always been. You see, people have always believed what they wanted to believe, made them feel better. Uh, you know, they've always accepted that their religious beliefs are right, and uh, mm -hmm. their beliefs about the state or the emperor are right. I see. And uh, so about whatever they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And at the present time in society, it, uh, 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 nationalism, for example. Well, nationalism, religious fanaticism, and also there's a belief that it's absolutely necessary to have economic growth when we know that if everybody were to grow, 
at that rate over the whole world it would uh, destroy the planet like a swarm of locusts. You see, we have to question that necessity. Mm -hmm. That may kill us, right? Mm. Um, along those lines, um, <laughs> if uh, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Archimedes hmm. who once said that, uh, give me a place to stand and to stick long enough and uh, I will move the world. If you were given a few moments of planetary silence, uh, a place to stand or sit, and a megaphone large enough, what message would you convey in an attempt to move the world in the direction it must go if well, it is to I would survive? Say we've got to pay attention to thought and to communicate our communication because that these absolute necessities interfere with communication so we can't listen to each other and can't work together. Mm -hmm. and if, we can't, uh, if we can't work together, then no idea is going to be of any use. Mm -hmm. So we have to begin, square one would be Paying attention to thought itself. And how it keeps us apart. I see. And that leads us to, to the, this notion of dialogue as you, yeah, yes. as you define the word. Yes, th this dialogue is uh, the Greek root dialogos. Logos means word, but meaning. Dia means through. So you can think of meaning flowing among people. And I gave the example of an anthropologist I read many years ago who studied a North American Indian tribe, the hunter-gatherers, and they would sit in a circle and just talk and talk about agenda without decisions or, or without authority or without anything. And then they would end up, it seems, with no conclusion and they would all know what to do because mm -hmm. they, they, they kept on talking. You know, they, they didn't just talk once, they would talk regularly, right? <laughs> right. Now, if, if we were able to do that, we would under... See, the main problem is that people are, are not able to listen and talk with each other and therefore how can they get together? Do you feel that the, at the present situation, the specific situation, that people are listening to each other uh, with regard to the international situation? Oh, well, not very much, no. Not very much. Which leads me to my, what I call my bonus question. It, it is, pertains specifically to the events of today as they're happening as we get together. Uh, on a recent uh, program on CNS, uh, CNN, journalist Robert Novak was interviewing uh, Dr. Gerald Post, professor of psychiatry and political uh, psychology at George Washington University in the United States. Uh, for more than 20 years, uh, Dr. Post prepared psychological profiles of world leaders for presidents and senior United States officials. Now here's the first question Mr. Novak asked. This is the question. Dr. Post, put simply, is Saddam Hussein a megalomaniac, a madman, or a rational seeker of power? Dr. Post answered this way, he is certainly not a madman, he is very much a rational seeker of power. He has, however, many personality features which make him an extremely dangerous man. Try as I might, I find no evidence of conscience in him. His ambitions are boundless for power. First, the question that Mr. Novak asked, is there such a thing as a rational seeker of power. Yes, well, I would ask why should anybody seek power? You see, that's the, uh, is there a good reason? You see, is there a valid reason? Mm -hmm. I mean, what does he want it for? I mean, they, they, there have been many, at least I heard there have been 12, 15 attempts to assassinate him, and eventually one is likely to succeed. Seekers of power often get assassinated. Mm -hmm. They suffer a great deal and so on. Why do they do it? Uh, now, there must be something, you see, I think that the world confuses people from early childhood. You see, it was Alexander the Great, and he uh, apparently was, had a very bad relation to his father, and his mother hated his father, and he was probably identified with his mother, and he probably felt he had to show his father <laughs> something. Boy. And he uh, gave him the energy to conquer the world, a tremendous energy with, uh, uh, he, he commanded absolute devotion from his troops and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, I mean, he's a much higher level than Saddam, obviously, but... <laughs> But could the, that action be considered rational? No, because I think I must ask why he did it. Uh, oh, I see. There was an irrationality because of the... the yes, and saying what, there, there's some incoherence in this whole thing. Why do you need power, you see? Uh, what for? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask why, because there's a thought in you of absolute necessity of power. Huh. And that, what, what gave you that thought? I mean, probably some experience that you were powerless. 
could it be society itself? Society constantly tells people they're no good, they're worthless, they're, you're nothing, you're just a little you, and you ought to be more, and so on, right? And also particular cases like troubles with fathers, mothers, teachers, you know, friends. Mm -hmm. So society embellishes the, no the notion that power is in fact well, something to strive for. And something well, like at least it creates in the person the feeling that he's powerless and that if he had oh. power, he would be all right. Mm -hmm. it's, it creates a very disturbing feeling of being powerless. Mm -hmm. You see, now when people feel powerless, they say, I need power. But I say, I, they, I think they need it like they need a hole in the head. <laughs> <laughs> what they've got to do is find out why do they feel powerless. So it comes from their powerlessness that they feel that they yeah, need that, power. That is the, that, yes, the, the belief in the absolute truth that they are powerless. You see, oh they are God, totally yeah. convinced they are powerless, right? Hmm. Which is why they strive for power. Yes, that's why they don't have any power, because they're convinced they haven't got any, right? And which, in fact, can never be... Uh, um, you know, they're never satisfied, because, be you see, that it's always on the conditioned record as a reflex that I need power. To, I may get as much power as you could imagine, but I still, like Alexander the Great said just before, but before he, uh, when he was right at the top, he said he was feeling s sad because he had no more worlds to conquer. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor Bowman, I want to thank you very much, really. I, I yeah. appreciate uh, the time you've taken to uh, be with us today. And, uh, hopefully we'll do it again. I thank hope you. so, yeah. I think we got it all. I think so.